Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I was pretty excited uh, a little over a week ago when I saw that our friend Griffin at the Armchair Historian had a new video about World War I, which you know is something I'm passionate about learning more about. And I just got back from a trip to Verdun. Some of you may have seen our hot tub live streams from Verdun, where uh, I and some of my friends spent the weekend. I uh, made some content. One of the videos is already up from that visit. That was our uh, look for relics on the battlefield, which is over on uh, the Stories of the Great War channel. And there will be several more videos that are going up in the weeks and months ahead. So definitely want to check those out. Uh, but for now, we're going to take a look at l the longest battle of World War I, Verdun. Yes, 303 days below the sun, if you're a Sabaton fan. That's how they describe it. Definitely one of the most horrific battles in human history. And the, the scars of that battle are all over the Verdun battlefield to this day. And that ba battlefield of Verdun, much of it is overlapped by one of the United States' most important battles in history. Certainly our largest offensive in history, the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, which is just to the west of Verdun and, and covers some of the same ground. Uh, so I'm excited to dive into this. The link is in the description, as always, to the original content. If you haven't already seen it, definitely check out the Armchair Historian. He does a great job with his work. Let's go ahead and dive into this one. Air over Verdun hangs heavily with the stench of war. Germany, undeterred by Entente offensives in 1916, aims to bleed France white. The French, steeled in resolve, stand ready to defend every inch of the River Meuse. With each explosion that rips through the sky, with each life snuffed out in the cold mud, their tenuous grip on hope tightens. German forces press in from three sides, and the men at Verdun prepare for a harrowing saga of valor and horror amidst the grim realities of war. So something he said there is not just an offhand comment when he said bleed France white. That is a, a, a phrase that is often associated with Verdun, and there's some controversy over it, too. Uh, Eric von Falkenhayn, who is the German general who is in command of these forces that are attacking Verdun, uh, after he is sacked when he doesn't take Verdun, uh, he's fired toward the end of the Battle of Verdun, and he's sent east. He goes to fight like down in Romania. Uh, in his memoirs later, he will say that it was never his intention to take and hold the city of Verdun. His intention was to bleed France white. Now, there's no evidence he said this before the battle, so there's a lot of people who argue that this was just kind of him retroactively saying that to kind of save face a little bit because it didn't go as well as he thought it would. But understand that by this point in the war, both sides understood that this was a war of attrition and this was about bleeding the other side white. It was about killing as many of the enemy as you could. It was less about taking ground than it was about killing a lot of the enemy, though there were certainly offensives. Uh, so that just a little bit of context for that statement. Situated about 250 kilometers northeast of Paris, Verdun, has always held a revered place in French history and sentiment. Its grounds have repeatedly bore witness to historic events, such as the Treaty of Verdun that marked the division of the Frankish Empire, its endurance during the Franco-Prussian War against Prussian besiegers, and its resilience against German encirclement during the First Battle of the Marne in 1914. At the core of Verdun's defense lay the fortified region of Verdun, or RFV, an intricate network of fortresses encircling the town. This network boasted over 20 major forts, flanked by numerous smaller fortifications, all constructed between 1870 and 1913. So why is this so important? Because you have the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, uh, in 71, which moves the border between Germany and France. Germany becomes a country out of this, the German Empire. Uh, so they take the regions of Alsace and Lorraine from the French. And so now what used to be the border between Germany and France is no longer the border. So now Verdun finds itself kind of the the front line major city in this region. So in the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War, thinking that someday they need may need to fight again, they start building this defensive line. 
And it, it's several rings of forts, and then all of the fortifications are connected by entrenchments. It's a, it's a massive complex of forts, and if you go there to this day, you can still see the remnants of it. It's not just the forts, but in between these forts, you've got these smaller concrete bunkers and uh, kind of what we would call pillboxes today. And uh, These are things that you'll see later on other parts of the battlefield, like you'll see this up around Ypres. The Germans will build a lot of these, but at this point, these are already here. Um, so Verdun was definitely a city that the French wanted to hold on to, but a lot of these fortifications were not built with 1916 technology in mind. By 1916, you've got the Germans with these massive artillery pieces, 14, 15, 16 inch guns in some cases. And if you go to like Fort Douaumont, uh, which is huge, uh, you can see some examples of this artillery. Uh, and so... Well, I don't want to get too far ahead. Among these, Forts Douaumont, Vol, and Souville were the most formidable. And they're all real Duomont close. Being the largest and newest, having been completed just three years prior to the battle. These forts were marvels of military engineering, their steel and concrete foundations buried under layers of earth, offering both camouflage and a degree of protection against artillery shelling. As yeah, this is a great diagram. Like if you go and you can go visit these forts, I've got a video coming out from Fort Duomont. If you stand up on top of it, it just looks like it's a hill. Like you can't even tell there's a fort there except for these little observation posts that stick out and a couple places where they had artillery that would stick out. Most of the forts built into the side of the ground, and it's a huge complex. You could put thousands of men in there easily. Since 1915 gave way to 1916, the front lines had wrapped around Verdun from three sides, choking off all but one supply route, 50 kilometers to the, the southwest. De this lifeline, christened the Sacred Way, became the conduit for hundreds of thousands of soldiers and a torrent of ammunition, offering a flicker of respite to the... So this this road was so important, and you see signs there all over the place, the Bois Sacre, um, was so important that it was a non-stop movement of supplies going into the Verdun area to where if a truck broke down, there wasn't time to fix it. They just pushed it off the road and kept on going because you couldn't slow things down even for a minute. People eagered defenders. Verdun held immense strategic importance for both France and Germany. For the French, it was a symbol of national determination, its fortifications guarding the pathway to Paris. For the Germans, capturing Verdun would not only demoralize the French army, but also potentially force France to seek an armistice. Moreover, its seizure would provide a tactical advantage, offering a stronghold on the Western Front. The First World War was one of the most destructive conflicts in human history, upending the social order and leaving millions of people dead, wounded, and displaced from their homes. One of the most interesting stories from the aftermath of the war is that of the Czechoslovak Legion. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Last Train Home by THQ Nordic, you can relive this unit's remarkable journey from the horrors of the Eastern Front through the brutal, civil war-ravaged countryside of Russia as they attempt to make their way back to their newly independent homeland via the long and dangerous Trans-Siberian Railway. Last Train Home is an RTS game that combines the real-time tactical combat experience of Company of Heroes with the resource management and strategic decision-making of a game like Frostpunk. Hmm. Deploy your squad, complete diverse objectives in a series of real-time missions while you level up your men and discover their individual stories by unlocking new skills, gathering better equipment, assigning medals, and helping them rise through the ranks. Interesting. Direct your men in their non-combat roles on board the train and unlock its full potential by upgrading the carriages and locomotive and oversee important maintenance work to keep it running. Choose your tactics wisely and use every skill to safeguard the lives of your soldiers and complete your mission. Support our channel today by clicking our link in the description below, download Last Train Home and experience firsthand the compelling narrative of the Czechoslovak Pretty Legion's cool. valiant fight on behalf of the Entente powers during the First World War and their long journey home. 
Overall, the onset of 1916 seemed to herald a tide of optimism for the central power. Oh, whoa, whoa. Griffin, new haircut. I like it, man. It looks good. I'm still a little jealous I can't grow a beard like that. In the east, their forces had carved deep into Russian territory during the Garlitsa Tarnoff Offensive. To the west, Germany held its ground against the Entente in Belgium and the Champagne region of France. The Entente's failed offensive near Verdun in the previous autumn further buoyed German morale. Meanwhile, their alliance with Bulgaria had tightened the noose around Serbia, yep. and although Italy had joined the Entente, their efforts were mired in the Isonzo Valley. Yeah, there's like 12, 13 battles of the Isonzo <laughs> River down there. It's a nightmare, uh, the Italian front between the Austro-Hungarians and the Italians. And yeah, uh, this whole thing, the whole war starts because the Austro-Hungarians are declaring war on Serbia, and then they have a nightmare trying to deal with Serbia, and it's only when Bulgaria enters the war that they're finally able to, the uh, Entente, or the uh, Central Powers are finally able to deal with Serbia. Offering little more than a distraction. Despite Verdun's strategic and symbolic significance, trouble was on the way. A lack of appreciation by French leadership, especially Chief of Staff Joseph Joffre, meant that the RFV was undermanned and under-equipped. In 1915. Yeah, so for example, uh, and I'm sure he's going to talk about this, they pull a lot of the artillery out of these places. So like Fort Douaumont was basically toothless, and it ends up being captured by, I think, a German sergeant with a gun who takes this massive fort. Uh, and then the French lose so many casualties trying to take it back. Uh, but you do have people who understand what's going on. You've got this guy named Colonel Driant who is in charge of the French light infantry. He's also a member of the French parliament. And he is screaming till he's blue in the face that the Germans are going to attack at Verdun, and nobody will listen to him. And it's one of the tragedies of the war that then he is killed on the very first day of the fighting at, at uh, Verdun, defending his position. Uh, when no one else would listen. And he's he's considered a French hero today, and uh, I actually did a video about him uh, that will be coming out. I know my friend JD did a video about Colonel Driant that's already up on the History Underground, so you can check that out now. Verdun's fortifications had already seen a reduction of over 237 guns yep. and a substantial amount of ammunition, leaving only its heavy turret guns. Despite the onset of trench constructions, Progress slowed due to resource diversion to the Second Battle of Champagne. By February 1916, Fort Douaumont, the largest in the region, was scarcely armed and was yep. used mainly as a barracks. Yep. In General Joffre's eyes, the forts of Verdun were outdated and not likely to stand up to the firepower of German artillery. But they did. Instead, he wanted to allocate manpower and materiel on more easily defensible positions across other theaters of the Western Front. But also, before the Battle of Verdun happens, the Allies are planning their next big Western Front offensive, which is going to take place at the Somme. Uh, I, the Somme battle doesn't start till July of 1916, but before Verdun happens, it's already in the works because the Somme is where the British and French lines come together. And so it's meant to be a joint uh, French-British offensive uh, with pretty equal numbers from both sides. But then when Verdun happens, the French have to allocate a lot of resources to that. So then it becomes a major British offensive with a little bit of French on the right side. It wasn't until political pressure mounted that Joffre ordered reinforcements to Verdun on January 23rd. The architect of the German assault Falkenheim. was their chief of general staff, Erich von Falkenhayn, who was driven by a complicated mix of motivations. Despite these central powers advancing well on the war front, Falkenhayn found himself ensnared in a labyrinth of political and economic dilemmas. The protracted nature of the war weighed heavily on his mind yeah. and drove home a conviction that sustained conflict for another two years would leave Germany in a bleak position. And he was 100% right about that. Falkenhayn understood that. Uh, he understood ever since he took over, I think it was late 1914 when he takes over as uh, as the, the lead German general on the Western Front. And uh, he understood that because of the Allied blockade, because of the manpower advantage that the Allies have, 
uh, that in the end, there's just no way that Germany can go several more years with this. In fact, there are a lot of people in the German army who believe when they don't take Paris in 1914 that Germany already can't win the war. So uh, Falkenheim was not a bad general. Uh, this just didn't go well for him. Falkenheim's political standing was precarious. The war had yet to bear the fruit of a major victory under his command, something that his rivals in the German court were keenly aware of. One of these rivals was Paul von Hindenburg, the celebrated commander of the Eighth Army. Whose yeah, but listen, let's to be to be fair to Falkenhayn, Hindenburg and Ludendorff are on the Eastern Front, and they're fighting the Russians. And no offense against the Russians, but while they got a lot of men, their army is not the French army. The French army is a much, much more formidable fighting force, as are the British and the, the British Commonwealth forces, the Australians, the Canadians, the New Zealand, uh, South Africa, all of these nations. The Belgians are on the Western Front. The Western Front's a totally different animal. His victory at Tannenberg cast a long shadow over Falkenhayn's accolades. While victories burgeoned in the East, Falkenhayn deemed them hollow in the grand scheme of ending the war victoriously. He viewed Russia's vast expanses and indomitable spirit as impenetrable to military conquest, a sentiment echoed in his phrase, the East gives nothing back. Mm. To Falkenhayn, it was Britain that was Germany's formidable adversary. Yet a direct confrontation was deemed futile given Britain's naval prowess, geographical insulation, and robust resupply channels. Falkenhayn believed that severing the Anglo-French alliance could disillusion Britain and expedite the end of the war. He surmised that a crushing blow to France at Verdun could be the catalyst for a much-needed breakup. This is a common theme with the Germans, is the idea of isolating and taking out one of the Allied powers. Uh, and I understand, we, we often use these terms interchangeably, allies, the Entente. Uh, by this point in the war, allies is a common term that's used to describe the forces that are facing off against the central powers, which is primarily Germany, uh, Austro-Hungary, the Ottomans, and then later on Bulgaria. Um, but yeah, so later on then in their last great offensive in 1918, they're going to try to do the same thing. But in this case, they're going to try to take the British out of the war so that the French will sue for peace. Part of Falkenhayn's attempts to reinforce his political power came in the appointment of Crown Prince Wilhelm as the commander of the Fifth Army at Verdun. While a novice in military command, the 34-year-old Wilhelm often ceded decision-making to his chief of staff, under directives from his royal father. Falkenhayn hoped that this dynamic would help intertwine royal prestige with military strategy, further advancing his own position within the high seats of imperial power. The German attack was initially slated for February 12, 1916, but inclement weather delayed the offensive another nine days. When February 21st finally came, the skies above Verdun roared with... And I should mention, too, that the terrain, if you've ever been to a place like Vermont or central Pennsylvania, the hills, the, the trees, that's kind of what this looks like. Uh, Verdun is not only a heavily fortified place, it's a heavily forested place, and it's very hilly. So the Germans are not only attacking fortifications, they're attacking fortifications in the woods uphill. German artillery. Over a million shells rained down in a relentless 10-hour bombardment on French positions. In the ensuing three days, shells. the Germans alternated between artillery showers and probing assaults on villages north of the RFV. Metho and the way you see him portraying this with the constant explosions, that's what this was like. This is not boom. Boom. You know, like the occasional. You're talking a million shells in an area basically the size of a city, uh, you know, a, a modern city today. I mean, that's the whole Verdun area. You're, you're talking 20 minutes from one end to the other, uh, maybe a half hour. And that's the area that takes a million artillery shells before this bombardment. I, I think somebody calculated at one time how many artillery shells this was. It was just nothing could live that wasn't underground or in fortifications. Methodically edging along the right bank of the Meuse. The major push commenced on February 24th, slicing through French defenses with alarming ease. A grave oversight had left Fort Douaumont thinly manned. 
Its capture on the 25th by German forces was a bloodless victory. Yeah, by a German the night force. The of February 26th <laughs> saw Philippe Pitain, the stoic commander of the French Second Army, bestowed with the command of Verdun's defenses. Same Philippe Pitain who's going to be the uh, be seen today as a traitor in France. Not because of Verdun, because he he's a hero after Verdun. But this is the same guy who's going to become... Uh, seen as a German collaborator because of the Vichy France government. And he's going to be sentenced to death at the end of World War II, but the sentence is commuted because of his frail health. It was a charge he accepted with steely resolve. Keenly aware of the looming threat, he orchestrated a re-garrisoning of the RFE's remaining forts, bolstering them with additional troops and essential supplies. This strategic move was vital in shoring up the defensive lines, ensuring they were braced for any assaults by German forces. While the German offensive on the right bank was swift and decisive, the left bank posed a greater problem. The difficult terrain of the left bank made the advances challenging, and its lesser strategic value made every casualty feel more than hard fought. So this left side here, this is where uh, this is going to become a part of the Meuse-Argonne battle, battlefield for the United States. Uh, and there's a big History Channel documentary coming out about that at the end of May uh, that I'm a part of. Uh, so you see here, the, the Meuse River is right here. And the Meuse-Argonne offensive is called that because it takes place between the Meuse on the right and the Argonne Forest on the left. And it's a, it's a south to north offensive. So this area here, places like the Mort Alm, the Dead Man, um, which are part of the Verdun battlefield are also going to be a part of the, um, the battlefield of 1918. In early March, German forces managed to seize two villages in the left bank. Their focus then shifted to the elevated grounds on the left bank, notably the formidable Cote 304 and Le Moram, or Dead Man's Hill. Within the leafy cover of Bois du Bourras, French heavy artillery took position, their sights set on thwarting German advances toward Cote 304 and the Dead Man's Hill, as well as disrupting the German rear lines. The toll of the battle began to mount with each passing day. The casualty numbers on both sides climbed steeply. By the end of February, despite the grim tally, neither the French nor the Germans were any closer to victory, heralding the protracted and bloody struggle that lay ahead. The control of these two hills seesawed between the French and the Germans throughout March, and they became the initial staging grounds for a staunch French resistance. And why is this so heavily fought over? Because it's less strongly defended by these big forts the way other parts of the Verdun defenses are. And so this is going to be a heavy focus for the Germans because it's, a, it's an opportunity to attack a less fortified part of the line and maybe get in behind some of those areas that they're having a hard time getting through. The defense orchestrated by General Pétain had roused admiration among the French ranks. However, General Joffrey grew increasingly discontented with Pétain's resolute focus on defense. In a bid to shift the strategy, Joffrey aimed to replace Pétain with a commander who echoed his own aggressive stance. So Joseph Joffre is an idiot in this case, uh, but he's not a alone idiot. This was, we've talked about this before, but, and they're getting away from it by this point. But going into the war, there's this idea called the cult of the offensive, which is basically that it is always better to attack than defend. And if you're defending, it's only while you prepare for a counterattack of your own, that, that you always have the initiative when you're attacking. And this is part of that mindset is that, okay, great, we're defending, we're holding, we're inflicting a lot of German casualties, but we have to attack. That's the only way we're going to win this battle is to attack nonsense. Yet, Pétain's burgeoning popularity proved a roadblock. Any abrupt removal risked political fallout. Navigating this delicately, Joffrey elevated Pétain to commander of Army Group Center, positioning Robert Nivelle as the new commander of the Second Army, a move designed to distance Pétain from Verdun while appearing politically prudent. 
On May 8th, a stroke of misfortune struck the German forces at Fort Duamont. Yep. An accidental munitions fire triggered a massive explosion, claiming hundreds of German lives. And you'll see when uh, when you see my video from Fort Duamont, there's actually where that happened. They basically just walled up that room uh, and turned it into a tomb for these German soldiers. And there are memorials there from both sides. And, and it's one of the really heartwarming parts of this horrible battle uh, in this horrible war is the way that you see in France how they show a lot of respect to the German soldiers. These German soldiers that were invading and occupying their country. Uh, to this day, they're remembered with honor because I think people recognize that on both sides, people were just fighting for their country and, and, and there was no good or evil. There was no you know, black and white in this scenario when you're talking about the regular soldiers. One speculation is that the blaze was ignited by soldiers attempting to heat coffee using flamethrowers. But regardless if this story is true, the explosion wreaked havoc, plunging the German garrison into disarray and damaging part of the fort. Seizing this unexpected opportunity, French commander Nivelle ordered an assault. A meticulous plan was drawn up, culminating in an ambitious attack on May 22nd. Preceding the assault, between May 17th and the 21st, French artillery unleashed a barrage of 370 mm and 300 mm shells, decimating numerous German defensive positions and downing several observation balloons. On the day of the French assault, the 36th Infantry Regiment faced resistance on the left flank, but the 129th Regiment made a gallant advance, breaching the fort and occupying its western half. However, their triumph was fleeting. German reinforcements swooped in, isolating the 129th Regiment and compelling a French retreat. But the saga of resilience continued at Fort Vaux. Beginning June 2nd, the fort endured a relentless German siege. Its garrison, dwindling in supplies and men, clung to survival. Major Sylvain Eugène Renal, the fort's commander, resorted to carrier pigeons for communication. On June 4th, amidst a dire supply shortage, he dispatched his last pigeon with a plea for resupply. This was a common thing, uh, even up until uh, 1918, late in the war, during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, you've got the guys in the Lost Battalion using carrier pigeons. It was a common thing. It was quite effective, really. The bird, albeit affected by poison gas, valiantly delivered the message to Verdun Citadel, earning the Legion of the Honor and the moniker The Brave. Relief arrived on June 5th, yet the situation at Fort Vaux remained grim. By June 7th, with merely 12 gallons of drinkable water left mm. for 600 men, Major Renau had no choice but to surrender. In a rare gesture of chivalry amidst the savage conflict, Crown Prince Wilhelm honored Renau with a gifted sword. Despite Vaux's capture, a distant glimmer of hope sparked on June 4th with the commencement of the Brusilov Offensive, which eased the pressure on the Western Front, though the respite was temporary. On June 23rd, German forces unleashed a ferocious assault, seizing ground before advancing toward Fort Souville. Amidst the chaos, Robert Nivelle implored his troops with a resounding cry, you will not let them pass, my comrades. A phrase that would later morph into the iconic battle cry, they shall not pass. Yeah, and uh, though he never said so directly, there's a lot of uh, people who believe that this is where uh, J.R.R. Tolkien gets his idea for uh, Gandalf's famous words when he stands in front of the Balrog in uh, The Lord of the Rings because uh, he is over at the Somme at this point uh, nearby, and so they certainly would have been aware of this. But we don't know for sure if that's where he was inspired by. It seems to make sense, though. But you see that phrase everywhere there to this day, they shall not pass. Uh, il ne passera pas. Uh, although there's a couple of different French phrases, but that's one of the ones that you'll see with that. I want to point out, too, that you see Fleury there in the center. And Fleury is one of, I think, nine villages that are said to have uh, mort pour la France, died for France, never rebuilt. Fleury is a haunting place to this day. When I was planning my first visit to the Western Front, I was talking to uh, a friend of the channel, Indy Nidell. You might know from uh, the Great War Channel or the World War II Channel or from Sabaton History. He actually reached out to me and he's a fan of the channel here and um 
we, we talked a little bit and I asked him, I said, what's one place I can't miss if I go to Verdun? He said, Fleury. You have to go to Fleury. He's absolutely right about that. It's a haunting place. You go there, they never rebuilt it. These villages still have mayors. They still uh, are considered to be incorporated villages, even though no one lives there. And they were all granted the uh, the Croix de Guerre, the French War Cross, uh, which is their highest military honor. Uh, just absolute destruction at places like Fleury. The relentless onslaught at Verdun was momentarily eased as July ushered in the Battle of the Somme, requiring the redeployment of troops along different front lines. By the end of August, Romania's declaration of war against the Central Powers opened up a new front, intensifying the already complex European conflict. Yeah, Romania gets rolled <laughs> once they come into the war, but... Um something like 75% of all of the French regiments on the Western Front will rotate through Verdun at least once during the 300 days of combat. Uh, so it's not like it's the same guys fighting the entire time. They're rotating new units, fresh units in as often as possible to kind of keep things going as much as they can. Uh, and if you go there today to a place like uh, Douaumont, where you have the Douaumont ossuary, where there's like 100,000 plus uh, sets of bones in these rooms, and you can actually see the bones and the skulls of these soldiers. Uh, and then there's a cemetery with like something like 14, 15,000 more. Uh, you can see the list of all of the regiments that fought there, and it just goes on and on and on. This was followed by a significant military reshuffle on August 29th, when Falkenhayn, weighed down by the quagmire at Verdun, was replaced by Paul von Hindenburg as the chief of the German general staff. Hindenburg, with a fresh perspective, shifted focus to other theaters of war yeah. as he recognized the diminishing returns of the Verdun campaign. He promptly ordered a halt to all offensive operations in the RFV, marking a tactical reevaluation. Hindenburg's strategic pivot aimed to better allocate Germany's military resources, seeking more favorable battlefields to change the war's trajectory, which had been largely stagnant and draining. Meanwhile, the French remained poised to reclaim the territory lost under Falkenhayn's leadership. In late October, a determined French assault began, with more than 700 guns pounding Fort Duhamel into submission. Within a week, thousands of shells had rained down, rendering the fort's defenses nearly derelict. Nivelle's novel creeping barrage tactics, where artillery fire barely precedes a steady infantry advance, ensured the German defenses stood no chance. Wasn't I, that kind of implies it was Nouvelle's concept? Uh, the creeping barrage predates uh, the First World War, though. The First World War is where it's really going to get perfected, uh, but it had been used in the Balkans before that. Um, but it's hardly only the French that are doing that. The creeping barrage is pretty much standard by this point. By the time French troops stormed the fort on the 24th, the Germans were already staging an evacuation, leaving only a skeleton force who yearned for reinforcements that would never arrive. By the end of that day, the French had captured over 6,000 prisoners and 15 artillery pieces. The tale was not different at Fort Vaux. Following devastating bombardments by French artillery, the Germans were forced to evacuate after a French shell caused a huge explosion. The French reasserted control over the fort shortly after, allowing for a moment of symbolic recuperation among the long-drawn bloodshed. On December 14th, leadership within the French army shifted from Joffre to Nivelle, marking a new phase. This change came just before the second offensive at Verdun, orchestrated by Generals Pétain, Nivelle, and commanded by General Charles Mangin. On the morning of December 15th, the calm was broken by the roar of guns signaling the French advance. The preceding six-day bombardment involving 827 guns and a total of 1,169,000 shells mm. had turned the battlefield into a pockmarked Crazy. crater. Artillery observation aircraft directed the final bombardment onto German positions, preparing the ground for infantry assault. At 10 a.m., the French infantry moved forward, shielded by a double creeping barrage of shrapnel and high-explosive fire. 
the barrage was designed to keep German defenders at bay while French troops advanced. The attack was effective. German defensive lines collapsed, with many soldiers captured as the French infantry closed in, accounting for over 13,500 German losses from the front divisions. Mm. Despite bad weather, the French troops reclaimed key positions lost earlier in February. The rapid pace of their advance left German reserve units scrambling to respond. By the night of the 16th and 17th, new French lines were established, extending beyond Douaumont and north of Fort Vaux. Though nearly unrecognizable with damage, French mm. positions had been reclaimed once again. The French not only recaptured key areas, but also pushed the closest German position over seven kilometers back from Verdun. So something to think about, too, with all of this is that when you have this kind of firepower going on for months and months and months in the same small concentrated area, not only does it devastate the land, but it leaves some parts of it permanently uninhabitable. Uh, especially when you're using gas uh, and a lot of those shells are still around. Uh, they have these red zones where people just can't live, the zone rouge, they call them. Uh, and you have to remember that you have, when you fire a million shells, 20 to 30% of those are duds. So that's two to 300,000 artillery shells that are unexploded that are laying all over the place. Uh, just in the Ypres salient alone up in Belgium, something like 300 civilians have died in the 100 years since the war from those unexploded shells. The same thing happens in Verdun, I'm sure. Uh, something like two dozen of the actual trained workers whose job it is to remove this stuff have died from handling this stuff. We walked through one little field, one maybe two acre location, and found multiple artillery shells, found at least three French grenades that were unexploded, just sitting right on the surface, let alone the stuff that's buried down in. And that was just walking through one little field. It was crazy. Claiming vital observation points, the battle resulted in over 11,000 German prisoners and 115 guns captured, boosting the morale of the French forces as they pressed further east. As French troops continued their advance through villages north of the RFE around December 18th, the terrifying siege of Verdun began to lift. The fields, once filled with the sounds of gunfire and explosions, started regaining a semblance of peace. Mm. The war tallies at Verdun were harrowing, with over 350,000 casualties on both sides, of which around 150,000 on both sides also perished. Although Verdun did not witness the gravest loss, its sheer length marked it as the longest battle in the war, going from February 21st to December 18th, nearly- And I should point out that of that number, that 300,000 or so dead, tens of thousands of them have never been found, are just still out there, were pulverized by explosions, were buried by that stuff, were buried where they, they fell and never recovered. They're all over that battlefield. That entire region is a giant war grave. 10 months in total. We just released a new exclusive video on the brutal My Lai Massacre mm. over on Armchair History TV. We've also done other exclusives like Operation Valkyrie or the Malmedy Massacre. New Armchair Historian exclusives are out every month and other historical creators are making uncensored exclusive videos every week. Unsen yeah, the unfortunate reality, and he, he's making a great point there, is that uh, YouTube's really kind of frustrating when it comes to what you can post. Uh, there's some videos I would like to do that I won't do uh, just because I know that they'll get age restricted. And if they get age restricted, nobody sees them. It doesn't recommend them to people. And I know it's happened to a lot of my fellow uh, YouTubers that have made videos and had them censored for one reason or another. So I'm glad that he's doing something like this. And I definitely would encourage people to check out uh, that channel that he has created uh, off of YouTube so that you can see that stuff. So uh, that was great. He always does a fantastic job with his work. So I hope you enjoyed that. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.